How you doing? Today, we're going to MacGyver up some fun memories and tips. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language. We talk about writing, history, rules, and other cool stuff. This week, we'll look at all the ways TV has influenced our language and tell you the secret rule for when to use more and most versus suffixes. New expressions are introduced into our everyday language all the time. And the more we use them, the more they become ingrained in our speech throughout the generations. And because we spend so much time watching TV, it's a huge contributor to how we use language. In fact, according to Nielsen, we in the U.S. are watching more TV than ever, an average of 153 hours every month. So it's not surprising that many words, phrases, and even speech patterns from TV have made their way into our day-to-day language. Some of these words and expressions are completely made up by our favorite TV characters, or more accurately, the writers behind them. Think Doe from The Simpsons, or Friend Zone from Friends. In other cases, the show itself inspired a word, the way the 1980s and 1990s TV show MacGyver, which featured an incredibly resourceful secret agent who seemed like he could fix almost anything with duct tape, led to MacGyver being used as a verb, as in, hold on and I'll MacGyver that broken chair. And other times, a TV show popularized the use of an existing word in a new way, as is likely the case for Googling things. Although Googling goes back to 1998, Buffy the Vampire Slayer gave it a big boost when Willow used it in a 2002 episode. It's supposedly the first time the word was used as a verb on TV, and it was so new they actually had to explain what it meant. The thing is, some of these expressions have become so ingrained in our language that we start to think they've been around forever and forget where they came from. Well, according to how stuff works, there are several different ways in which we use language from TV. The first is jargon, which the website defines as, quote, the language used by a specific group or profession, unquote. How many medical and legal dramas are on TV now? And how much have we picked up from them? For example, how many Grey's Anatomy fans started using the word stat to mean right now? And what about sports speak? TV sports announcers and sports in general have popularized expressions like bench warmer, out of bounds, and throwing in the towel. These terms all have literal meanings in sports, but they're also used figuratively in our everyday language. For example, bringing that up in the meeting was out of bounds, or I've had enough of this project, I'm throwing in the towel. TV also has had an effect on our speech patterns and dialects. Ever since the Rocky and Bullwinkle show cartoon in the 1960s, sinister villains have had Eastern European accents and dialects. Think of Gru from Despicable Me and Minions, which is being turned into a TV series, by the way. This also includes U.S. English dialects. For example, have you ever given your friends a long, drawn-out, Hello! made popular by Seinfeld? or imitated the guys from The Sopranos with forget about it. And by the way, forget about it was added to the Oxford English Dictionary in 2016. The first use they found goes all the way back to 1987 in the book Bonfire of the Vanities by Tom Wolfe. Next, if you've ever imitated Joey from Friends with how you doing, or used the Star Trek line that resistance is futile, You've peppered your speech with a TV catchphrase. You probably know that meh means so-so or whatever, but do you know where it came from? Well, it's probably from Yiddish, but it made its way into popular American English in the 1994 episode of The Simpsons. And Seinfeld comes up again, too, with catchphrases that are now common, including double dip, low talker, and re-gifting. We often use these catchphrases to fit in with others or just to be funny. Next, plenty of slang words have found their way into our collective language through TV. For example, Ashton Kutcher's MTV show popularized the word punked to mean tricked. And we all know and hate spam, 
which actually comes from a 1970 episode of Monty Python's Flying Circus, set in a cafe where a waitress recites a list of menu items, each one with an increasing amount of the canned meat spam. All the Viking patrons started singing the word until it's all that can be heard. According to Business Insider, in the 80s and 90s, users began to inundate chat rooms with lyrics from the spam song. The term "spamming" became popular and now refers to the dreaded practice of sending unsolicited messages or advertisements to lots of people. Ugh. Lastly, TV has given us lots of acronyms. Most of us know what WMDs, weapons of mass destruction, and the CDC, Centers for Disease Control. We know what these are from watching the news. If you happen to watch Jersey Shore, we won't tell. You also know what GTL means: Jim Tan Laundry. And now we know crime scene investigators as CSIs, thanks to the franchise of the same name. Just like we know about MASH, Mobile Army Surgical Hospital units, from the popular show from the 1970s and early 80s. What's fascinating is that these boob tube words and phrases have become so commonplace in our day-to-day -day language that we don't even have to think about them. Whether we hear them ourselves while Netflixing and chilling, or just hear others use them, we can figure out their meaning. And the more they're used, the more they become part of our language and hence our culture. That's the power of TV. Not that there's anything wrong with that. That segment was written by Susan Herman, a retired U.S. government multidisciplined language analyst, analytic editor, and language instructor. When you want to modify a noun, is it okay to stick a more or a most in front, or a less or a least? Well, no, not always. Let's take a look at adjectives first. Adjectives such as tall, squeaky, careful, and extraordinary describe nouns. There are two ways to make a comparison with an adjective. You can use more or most in front of the adjective. For example, more wonderful. Or you can use the suffixes er and est on the end of the adjective. For example, squeakier. For the most part, which one you choose depends on how many syllables the adjective has. Comparisons involving adjectives with one syllable or three syllables or more follow clear-cut rules, whereas the situation is different for adjectives with two syllables. One-syllable adjectives use the suffixes er or est on the end of the adjective. For example, tall has one syllable. So, if you wanted to compare the height of your family members, you might say, "I'm taller than my sister, but I'm not the tallest in the family." It would sound odd to say, "I'm more tall than my sister, but I'm not the most tall in the family." There are exceptions for some irregular one-word adjectives, though, such as good and bad. You say better and best, and worse and worst, not gooder and badder, and goodest and baddest. Now, you might encounter baddest in colloquial English, as in he's the baddest of the bad, but I wouldn't say that in front of your English teacher. Adjectives with three or more syllables use more or most in front of the adjective. For example, with the five-syllable adjective extraordinary, you use more or most, as in that is the most extraordinary hat I've ever seen. You can't say extraordinariest; that's a mouthful. The new Fowler's Modern English Usage did mention that you could use polysyllabic adjectives with an unexpected er or est on the end to create a special effect. Alice from Alice in Wonderland, for example, said "curiouser" and "curiouser." Two-syllable adjectives are a little trickier than the others we've discussed. Or is that more tricky? It's actually trickier. Sometimes you have to use the suffixes. Other times you have to use more or most. And in some cases, you can use either one. The adjectives squeaky and careful have two syllables. So, do you say squeakier or more squeaky, carefulest or most careful? Well, as far as squeaky, you use the suffixes, as in the squeakiest wheel gets the grease. On the other hand, you can't say carefuler and carefulest. 
you have to say more careful and most careful. When it comes to two-syllable adjectives, it seems a bit arbitrary whether you use the suffixes or the words in front. But I did find one rule to help you: two-syllable adjectives that end in y, o, w, and l, e can take the suffixes e, r, and e, s, t. And you can remember that by thinking they are yowly, howly, y, o, w, l, e, yowly. Or better yet, think that they are yowlier and howlier than everything else. So you remember the adjective endings y, o, w, and l, e, and the rule to end them with e, r, or e, s, t. They're yowlier and howlier. A listener, Ashley, wondered if she should say more subtle or subtler. Well, since subtle ends in l e, you'd use subtler and subtlest. According to this rule, funny, mellow, and gentle are other examples of two-syllable adjectives that take the suffixes, making the correct choices funnier, mellower, and gentler. Sometimes, though, no rule will help you determine which way to make a comparison. Some two-syllable adjectives can go both ways. You can say commoner or more common, tranquilist or most tranquil, stupider or more stupid, and naivest or most naive. According to Garner's Modern English Usage, which specifically lists those two-way adjectives, quote, the terminational forms are usually older, and some of them are becoming obsolete. Unquote. So, tranquilist, for example, which sounds a little odd to me and raises a flag in Microsoft Word's spell checker, is moving out of favor. If you have a two-syllable adjective that doesn't end in y, o, w, or l, e, it's not yowlier. You need to rely on your ear or your dictionary. And Garner's Modern English Usage says that quote, if a word ordinarily takes the e, r, or the e, s, t suffix. And that formation sounds more natural. It's poor style to use the two-word form with more or most. Unquote. Now, so far we've talked about adjectives, but adverbs follow the same rules. Adverbs are words that describe adjectives, verbs, or other adverbs. For example, with the one-syllable adverb "soon," you add the suffix, as in "whoever finishes the chores soonest will earn a prize." You wouldn't say most soon. For adverbs with three or more syllables, such as comfortably, you need to say more comfortably, not comfortablier. Some two-syllable adverbs, such as early, take the suffixes, so you'd say earlier and earliest. And some others, such as sadly, take more or most, as in more sadly and most sadly. If you're unsure, check a dictionary. If the suffix form is allowed, as it is with earlier, for example, it'll be listed in the dictionary entry. The comparisons we've been talking about have all involved a greater amount of something. When you're talking about not as much of something, you use less and least in front of adjectives or adverbs with any number of syllables. For example, you might admit, "I'm less athletic than my best friend." Or if you're using an adverb, you could lament, "My roommate is the least grammatically oriented person I know." That's all for now, but that's not the mostest we can say about comparisons. I mean, that's not all. So be sure to listen next week for part two. That segment was by Bonnie Mills, who's been a copy editor since 1996. Finally, I have a familect story. Hello, my name is Frederick. I live in Montreal, and in my family's unique way of saying a TV remote is the click a clack. I believe the click a clack comes from the fact that all throughout my childhood we had a really old TV with a really old remote that still had physical buttons. Then when we press it down, it goes click and clacks in the plate until you press a different button. So our TV remote name is the click a clack. Have a nice day. They did used to be a lot louder, clickier. Thanks so much. If you want to share the story of your family act, a word your family and only your family uses, call the voicemail line at eight three three two one four girl. Call from a nice, quiet place, and we might play it on the show. 
Grammar Girl is a quick and dirty tips podcast. Thanks to our audio engineer, Nathan Sims, and our director of podcasts, Adam Cecil, who recently learned to make chapchae from the Korean vegan. And I didn't know what that was, so I looked it up, and it's a noodle dish that looks delicious. Thanks also to our digital operations specialist, Holly Hutchings, our ad operations specialist, Morgan Christensen, and our marketing associate, Davina Tomlin. Finally, Cameron Lacey just finished her internship with us, but she also graduated magna cum laude with a degree in marketing and is on her way to an MBA program in the fall. We'll miss you, Cameron. You are a rock star, and thanks for everything. And I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. That's all. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.